Um, good evening and welcome to everyone uh, in this room and in the other two rooms that are filled with our guests tonight. It is an absolute delight to have so many people here for tonight's lecture, and I hope we see you all at the rest of the Aesthetic Activism Symposium tomorrow and on Saturday. Tonight's and tomorrow night's talks and the events of the next two days together make up our ninth J. Irwin Miller Symposium. The nine symposia have all been supported by an endowment established in 2010 by the kind generosity of Mr. Miller's children, Catherine, Margaret, Elizabeth, and Will. We are grateful to the Miller family for choosing to honor the memory of their father through a gift to the School of Architecture. J. Irwin Miller was, born, was a 1931 Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Yale College, uh, where he majored in Greek and Latin. After Yale, he continued his education at Oxford University, where he studied philosophy, politics, and economics. And in 1934, he began his professional career with the family business, uh, Cummins Engine Company, ultimately serving as president and chairman, and in that capacity, hiring good architects, graphic designers, landscape architects, including Eero Saarinen, Kevin Roach, Dan Kiley, and Alexander Girard. Cummins was, and also is still, noted for hiring male and female engineers from uh, diverse backgrounds from around the world. Mr. Miller was an extraordinary person, a successful businessman, a leader nationally and in his community, a loyal alumnus of Yale, I have to get that in there, um, and a fierce advocate for freedom of choice and a believer in opportunity for all. His great respect for the power of architecture improved, to improve public life is reflected in the famous program of patronage he established in his home city of Columbus, Indiana. He was a man of great curiosity and intellect, an outstanding citizen, an embodiment of ethical behavior, a model for us all, perhaps most particularly these days. Before introducing the introducer of tonight's speaker, uh, I would like to express my appreciation to the very many who helped make this weekend's events possible, particularly Richard de Flumery, Robbie Lynn Hornoy, and who are our school's special events coordinators, and to Associate Dean John Jacobson, each of whom has contributed mightily to the smooth running, I hope smooth running, <laughs> and the massive coordination that this all required. Uh, my sincere thanks also to the architects, artists, academics, students, thinkers, and friends of the school who have joined us for this event. It is now my pleasure to introduce Associate Professor and Assistant Dean Mark Foster Gage, who organized this J. Irwin Miller Symposium. Mark received his Bachelor of Architecture from Notre Dame in 1997 and a Master of Architecture from Yale in 2001. Combining teaching with writing and professional practice, Mark's design work has been exhibited in institutions including the Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of the Art Institute of Chicago, the Venice Biennale, the Beijing Biennale, and the Prague Biennale of Experimental Architecture, among many others. Mark's work has also been published in venues as varied as Vogue, Fast Company, the New York Times, and Harper's Bazaar, and has been seen on PBS, Fox, and MTV. He has designed architectural projects across a variety of typologies, ranging from the new Live Arts Center at Bard College to the 20-story Orem Residential Tower in Manhattan. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Mark Foster Gage. Uh, thank you, Deborah. That was a beautiful introduction. I always wish my mom was in the audience when I hear beautiful introductions <laughs> about me. She'll have to watch the video. Uh, welcome to everyone in this room and also in the overfull of rooms. I think it's a great testament to uh, Elaine Scary's draw that we have filled nearly three rooms full of people eager to hear her. I'm gonna be giving the opening talk to this symposium proper tomorrow at 10 a.m. when we reconvene. Uh, and that panel will feature Keller Easterling, Catherine Ingraham, Timothy Morton, and is moderated by Jonathan Massey. Um, so we encourage you all to come uh, for that, as well as the rest of the symposium. Um, I wanted to start with a, a reading from the book of Scary. A beautiful face drawn by Verrocchio glides into the perceptual field of a young boy named Leonardo. The boy copies the face, then copies the face again, then again, and again, and again. 
He does the same thing when a beautiful living plant, a violet, a wild rose, glides into his field of vision. Or a living face, he makes a first copy, a second copy, a third, a fourth, a fifth. He draws it over and over, just as Pater, who tells us all this about Leonardo, replicates, now in sentences, Leonardo's acts, so that the essay reenacts its subject. These are some of the opening lines of Elaine Scarry's book on beauty and being just, with which she describes how beauty migrates through both time and culture. To me, their exact recitation is the only way to illustrate not only that is Elaine Scarry's writing courageous for nearly 20 years ago addressing what I would consider to be the then third rail of philosophy, beauty, but it's a, the writing itself borders on being a form of intellectual lyrical sorcery. His most beautiful form of irony that Elaine writes about beauty with staggering beauty. Professor Scary's intellectual reach, however, far exceeds beauty and extends into the darker territories of human experience. She writes courageously on to note a few examples, torture and injury in the body, in the body and pain, the making and making of the world, on crisis behavior in thinking and an emergency, and most recently about constitutional injustice, thermonuclear monarchy choosing between democracy and doom, which seems an apt title for our upcoming election. Elaine Scarry received her BA from Chatham College and her PhD from the University of Connecticut prior to teaching at the University of Pennsylvania from 1974 until 1989. Since then, she has occupied the position of the Walter M. Cabot Professor of Aesthetics and General Theory of Value at Harvard University. Professor Scarry's list of achievements and honors is vast. She has received a Truman Capote Award, uh, Truman Capote Award for Literary Criticism, was published in the anthologies The Best American Essays in 1995, 2003, and 2007, and has been listed as one of the top 100 leading public intellectuals by both Prospect Magazine and Foreign Policy. Professor Scarry has also received an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Northwestern University and was inducted into the American Philosophical Society as a member in 2013. It is an honor to welcome Elaine Scarry to Yale as she now places you in the role of the young Leonardo and glides into your own perceptual field to deliver the opening dress for the symposium Aesthetic Activism as she delivers her much anticipated lecture, Building and Breath, Beauty and the Pact of Aliveness. Well, it's always a, a deep pleasure to be at Yale, and I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here tonight. When people talk about beauty, they're sometimes talking about the beautiful object itself, which might be a formation of clouds in the sky, or it might be a beautiful face, or it might be a mathematical proof. And at other times, when they talk about beauty, they're really talking about the perceptual event that happens to the perceiver. And one thing that's been true over many, many centuries is that poets and philosophers have described the relation between the perceiver of beauty and the beautiful object itself as a life pact. For example, in 8th century BC, Homer wrote the Odyssey, and there's a moment in the Odyssey when, after having been nearly killed at sea, Odysseus is washed up on an island where a beautiful young girl named Nausicaa lives. And when Odysseus sees Nausicaa, he realizes that he's been saved from the man-killing ocean. You might think that Odysseus would feel that sense of relief and life affirmation at the moment when he first sees the shore coming into view after scores of days on the ocean. But actually, as you can see from this passage, when he gets in sight of shore, he feels no relief at all. But when he was as far away as a man's voice carries when he shouts and heard the boom of the sea upon the reefs, for the great wave thundered against the dry land, belching upon it in terrible fashion, and all things were wrapped in the foam of the sea, for there were neither harbors where ships might ride nor roadsteeds, but projecting headlands and reefs and cliffs. Then the knees of Odysseus were loosened and his heart melted, Nowhere doth there appear a way to come forth from the gray sea. 
For without are sharp crags, and around them the wave roars foaming, and the rock runs up sheer, and the water is deep close in shore, so that in no wise is it possible to plant both feet firmly and escape ruin. It's also the case that once he arrives on shore, he feels no relief. And I won't read this whole passage, but it begins, and all his flesh was swollen, and seawater flowed in streams up through his mouth and nostrils. He's vomiting seawater, and he says, no matter where I am, I'm going to be killed. I can either lie here on the beach, in which case I'm going to freeze and get sick and die, or I can make my way up to the woods and fall asleep there, and then I'll be eaten. I'll be taken as prey by an animal. It's only when he sees Nausicaa that he suddenly describes himself as having been rescued from the man-killing sea. And that description is um, given in a very similar way about 12 centuries later when St. Augustine um, on the northern coast of Africa writes a treatise called De Musica in which he describes the importance of symmetry and equality in all kinds of phenomena, um, such as dance steps and smooth surfaces and rose petals, but first and foremost in music itself. And he describes music as a life-saving plank in the midst of the ocean. If we trip forward a number of centuries again to the um, early 14th century, um, the, or the very end of the 13th century, we know that when Dante saw the face of Beatrice, he wrote the Divine Comedy. But before he wrote the Divine Comedy, he wrote a little book um, in 1294 that was simply about the fact of having seen um, Beatrice. And uh, it just again and again shows him not even talking to her, but crossing her path on the street. And that book is called La Vita Nuova, The New Life. That intuition that when you come into the presence of beauty, you're in the presence of new life, is also saluted by the um, 20th century poet Rilke, who in the poem about the archaic torso of Apollo, which is a very beautiful poem about the fact that this statue, though it has no um, head, is, um, and I don't know why this arrow is shimmering. Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> The, the, the poem is about the fact that though uh, Apollo is headless, the, his, his, the luminosity of his gaze, the brightness of his vision shines out from his whole torso, and a smile breaks across the curve of his um, hips and thighs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Trevor. Um, so the, the, we can see that, that um, beauty is, is a, a life pact in the case of, um, of poets, and we can also see this in philosophers. For example, in Kant's third critique, he associates beauty with aliveness continually. Now, usually in accounts of the third critique, this feature isn't mentioned, but there is a philosopher at Emory University named Rudolf McCreel, who's written about the third critique, who makes it very evident how important that feature is to Kant. And so far, I've only been citing um, poets and philosophers, but people in all kinds of fields um, have noted this. For example, the, um, the archaeologist and religion scholar named Francesco um, Polizzi notes that when he talked to one Native American people and asked them what in their language was the word for beautiful, they responded by saying it was the word alive. Another example from a seemingly very distant field comes from the astrophysicist uh, Mario Livio, who works at the Hubble um, Space Telescope. Um, and who, he wrote a book about symmetry and beauty and symmetry all throughout the universe, including in very pa small patches close to home, um, such as the letters of the alphabet. He noted that many letters in our alphabet have bilateral symmetry. If you put a line through the A or the H or the M or the O, it will be the same on the left side as on the right side. But that doesn't tell anything about the affirmation of life. What does tell something about the affirmation of life is that he goes on to speak about palindromes, which are sequences of letters 
that read the same way forward as backward. And he notes that the Y chromosome um, is made up of many palindromic sequences of um, 50 million sequences of letters in the Y chromosome. Over 6 million of them are palindromes. So again, we can see the, um, the importance of, um, of beauty in the, this kind of affirmation of life. Now, what is the literal claim that is being made here? Um, we hear about being rescued from a man-killing sea, or we hear about a plank in the midst of the ocean, but what literally is being said? And I think there are a number of literal claims that are being made. The one is that beauty restores our faith or trust in the world. And I'm sure that many of you have had the experience of being in a dire situation or working on some very brutal subject and then suddenly seeing something beautiful and the sense of reassurance that that gives. It almost gives one um, strength to, to continue the project. The second, I think, literal claim is that beauty increases our perceptual acuity. Um, it raises the bar for what counts as perception. Sometimes people worry that a beautiful face will rob attention from other less beautiful faces, or a beautiful building will divert our attention from this building project over here that's in need of repair. And when my students, for example, worry about that, I suggest to them that they conduct the following experiment. The next time you're walking down the street and like Socrates seeing Phaedrus, you suddenly see someone or something that makes your knees buckle because it, it or it, the person is so beautiful. Ask yourself, were you walking along being hugely mindful of everyone in the world and being capacious and caring? Or were you in fact walking along in a nearly numb state until this beautiful thing or, or beautiful person, it could be a mathematical formula, whatever, um, wakes you up. And then that raises the bar, as I said a moment ago, for what counts as perception. And either the person herself has the ethical awareness to say, the attention that I'm giving uh, effortlessly to uh, the beautiful face of this child deserves to be given to her more cumbersome adults surrounding her. Um, <laughs> or if the person himself or herself doesn't think that, um, somebody else might tap the person on the shoulder and say, you know, the attention you're giving to this building really ought to be given equally to these buildings over here. Now, so far, it sounds like this life pact is one directional, that the perceivers are the recipients of the particular life gift of beautiful things, and that we give nothing in return. But I think a moment's reflection will tell us that when we see beautiful things, um, in the world that incites us to care for them and to take care of them. Um, for example, it might be that the beautiful thing is already a live thing. Uh, children and the infants of most species tend to be very appealing immediately, and it elicits um, a, a great deal of care. But a brook is a live thing, a meadow is a live thing. Now, Here's the thing, even if the beautiful object is not alive, for example, a canvas, a painting is not alive, but when it gets stolen from the Gardner Museum or when it gets stolen from the National Gallery in Berlin, people all over the world are alarmed that its surface will be hurt even though that surface is not alive, even though they may themselves never see it or even aspire to see it, but they're just, they, they perceive it as something that is woundable and in danger. Now, this gives us a glimpse of beauty and the pact of aliveness. And what I want to contemplate for the next few minutes is more specifically that pact in the realm of buildings. Buildings, even at their most minimal, the small fragments of netting that can be seen um, in this shelter. A house, whether in its most minimal or its most maximal form, transforms us from being creatures wholly at the mercy of rain, of strong sunlight, of insects, and of crowded living conditions into creatures who can merely by our passage from inside to outside regulate the rain's ability to reach us or the sun's ability to reach us or the number of people who stand in our field 
a vision. And of course, there's a reciprocal act going back uh, that, that the person then has to take care of the shelter. And the more magnificent your shelter, the more care you're going to have to put into it when the hurricane um, comes to town. Now, today, I think there's, um, it's understood by everyone that there are not just tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of people um, moving across the earth. But when uh, Sabatea Salgado did his migrations exhibit in the late 90s and published this book on migrations in the year 2000, it was a wake-up call to everybody that, um, that huge numbers of people were in a nearly homeless state moving across the um, surface of the earth. And I just want to focus for a moment on two features of Salgado's migrations exhibit. The first is something that is brought to mind by the work of public health physicians who point out that there's a difference between narrative compassion and statistical compassion. We're pretty good at narrative compassion. That is when we're asked to care about one person or two people or three people. But we're dreadful at statistical compassion. And one thing about Salgado was that his exhibit, I mean, he's really one of the few artists I can think of whose aim was to elicit from us statistical compassion. Since there were um, thousands of people, even tens of thousands of people, in some of his photographs. And he photographs people in many different places, but all three that I've just shown are from the Wand Rwandan camps in um, Tanzania. The, um, and you can see, by the way, in this photograph, the shelters that are um, if to the, going on the hillside up to your right, and the hillside up to the left, and the hillside um, out in front of you. Um, the second feature is that they're beautiful. And you may know that when he did this exhibit, he was criticized for treating a very dire subject with such beauty, even though, until the day before he did the exhibit, no one was aware of that dire uh, subject. And probably, if it hadn't been so beautiful, not so many people would have um, looked at it. And you may also know that he reports that when he was doing this, uh, this, the photographs, no matter how bad the situation was, there were always little children in the vision, in the field of his camera, trying to get in the way of the camera. So he made a compact with them that if they would just agree to stay out of his field of vision, he would then make a portrait of them. So with the, the result is that side by side with his migrations exhibit is the exhibit or the book called The Children which is a series of um, portraits of individual children. And one of the things that's striking about them is how often some fragment of beauty is um, on the child, whether it's a necklace or bracelets or a beautiful piece of textile. So in this child from Cambodia, what are we to make of the um, bracelets she's wearing? Um, I think that, that it's fair to say that the bracelets are for her uh, the, law, the, the plank in the ocean, the life-saving plank in the midst of the ocean. In the time when um, beauty was in taboo in literature departments, there was a widespread view, which seemed to me preposterous, so forgive me if any of you hold it, and probably some of you do, um, that beauty is middle class. And, uh, and when I wrote on beauty, I didn't address this because it seemed as though 15 seconds of empirical experience would tell you that people who are very rich often care a great deal about beauty, and people who are very poor care a great deal about beauty. Um, and that be the love of beauty is universal. It's only the objects that differ, just as all our objects change. And by the way, the plurality of beauty is, I think, one of its most striking features. The plurality of beauty often troubles people, but we would be in a terrible straits if we all chose the same spouse, and we would even be in terrible straits if we all lived in the same um, design of a house. So the, um, the, the, the particular uh, pictures that uh, Salgado ended up doing of the children um, are a reminder that, uh, that uh, beauty is, is a life-saving uh, across the board and, and in all, um, in all uh, 
economic classes and all countries. Um, now, a house is also alive, I think, and, and I've purposely taken a, a building in its most minimal um, appearance. A house is a piece of materialized cognition, a live act of creation in which two mental events merge and are then materialized in the external world. First, the perception of the human susceptibility to environment. Second, the counterfactual wish to be free of the, uh, of the uh, to, to free the person of that uh, environmental susceptibility. Um, and I, I write about the way in which this works in other kinds of objects in uh, the chapter on the structure of artifacts in the body and pain. But a chair, for example, a chair takes over the work of a skeleton and relieves us of the problem of body weight. It would be hard to keep thinking about other subjects if one had to always be carrying one's own body weight. So one could say that a chair is an externalized manifestation of the human spine, the human skeleton. But that would understate what a chair is because if you, if you imagine a person looking at somebody and seeing the problem of body weight and simultaneously performing the counterfactual act of wishing that problem to be gone. If you said, what is the structure of that perception? The structure of that perception is the chair. Um, so too, a light bulb. If you imagine somebody looking at a human being and saying, the person is dependent uh, on sun and cannot, is blind half the day. And then you imagine him also saying, having the counterfactual wish that that not be the case. And you say, what is the structure of that merged perception? The factual perception and the counterfactual act, it is the structure of a light bulb. And we're seeing a much simpler instance of it in the shelter. Now, a second kind of building that um, is on the cusp between life and death is um, a hospital. And, um, I was at Yale Medical School a couple of years ago that I uh, first heard about the research that had been done in 1984 in Sweden by um, a professor of architecture named Roger Ulrich, perhaps you know this work, um, where a study showed that post-operative patients who were in rooms that looked out on uh, beautiful natural scenery recovered from the operation much more quickly and used much less painkiller than matched patients whose windows looked onto a brick wall. Um, th since that time, as Nathan Stahl writes in an article in the Canadian Medical Journal in a recent issue, uh, there have been 1,200 studies confirming the fact that healing is assisted and um, sp speed sped up by, the, um, by beautiful conditions. And um, the, these beautiful conditions usually involve a, a single bedroom, um, some kind of accommodation of visitors, a good acoustical environment, daylight, views of nature, um, and in many hospitals, artworks and um, interior gardens. And if you look on, online um, uh, under beautiful hospitals, you will find many articles that say 25 most beautiful hospitals in the United States, 10 most beautiful hospitals, and the pictures show they are indeed beautiful. Um, and you might say, oh, this is a competition, but competition, as Brooke Hindle shows in his book called Emulation and Invention, which is about the invention of the, uh, of the steam engine and the, and the telegraph, emulation means there's a shared object of aspiration. And the shared object of aspiration in this case is the um, healing of the, the patients and the, the healing power of beauty. The particular hospital I chose is not in the United States, and I don't know if it's on any list, but it's very beautiful. And it's by uh, Moshe Safdi in Colombia, and it's a 400-bed hospital that has its major axis a kind of bamboo forest or bamboo corridor. Um, these are two more pictures, and many, many of the doors um, open out onto this bamboo corridor. And then, in addition, um, it, it, I think the bamboo corridor you can see in the arcing green um, halfway down the building, but in addition, it has what the firm uh, describes as five fingers that reach out to the lagoon or bay, all of which 
overlook a healing garden um, so that it maximizes the person's access to some um, beautiful vision. And this is an aerial photograph of that same um, building, and the rooms often are, um, as in many hospitals in the United States, very um, airy and, and beautiful. Um, now, one of the reasons I chose this particular hospital is that Moshe Safdie's work, as you know from Habitat 67, has often been dedicated to trying to solve the problem of how you have people living who live in a dense situation still have a great deal of air and light. And this is just one of his buildings in Singapore um, that is called the Singapore Sky Habitat with aerial streets and gardens. And um, there are many walkways and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, and yet, if you, if you look at Moshe Safdie's um, work, all kinds of buildings have that, those same kind of property, whether it's a public library in Utah, or the Peace Institute in Washington, DC, or the building that honors the courage of soldiers that he built in um, South Carolina. Um, I said a few moments ago that one of the key features of beauty is its plurality. So um, if I choose something that isn't your the beautiful object you would think of, if you just take, you imagine um, some other object and um, test the principles of what I'm saying against that object um, to see whether it's true or not. Now, so far I've made good on, or tried to make good on the title, Beauty and the Pact, the subtitle, Beauty and the Pact of Aliveness, but um, there's that title that um, Mark uh, conscripted me into. Well, I think I said the title, and then he said, yes, Building and Breath. So now I have to make good on that. Um, and I, I, I will do it by talking about um, breath as air, breath as wind, breath as voice. I won't really talk about breath as breathtaking, except to say that with the exception of people, if you look across all the arts, it is architecture that most often gets the adjective breathtaking. And I guess it's because of the fullness of the presence of the, the thing being made. Um, but I'll, I'll talk at first about beauty as air. And there's a wonderful architectural poem that probably many of you know um, by the romantic poet Coleridge called Kubla Khan. And um, it starts out with this underground world of um, caverns of ice. And by the end of the poem, he's going to uh, assert that he can lift it up into the air. So I'm just going to show you the beginning and end of the poem. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round. And there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. And here were forests ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. Now, as you can imagine, there have been many different sources proposed for this poem. Um, some people say it comes from the East. Some people say it comes from the West, from the Bible, no, from the Quran, uh, from this century, no, from that century. I myself was struck this summer when I was reading Marco Polo's um, description of the Mongol Empire in the year 1300, the same year in which Dante is writing, of how many details are being transcribed uh, that, of Kublai Khan's um, residence into, uh, into this poem um, that's called Kublai Khan. Um, for example, meadows with rills of brooks running through them and walls within walls within walls and a, a mountain uh, that, that um, ha is built there that has evergreen trees on it. Um, and when we get to the end of the poem, I just the, the italicized line that I really want to focus on, but um, a damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw, it was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song, to such a deep delight twould win me that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those co caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware. The poem is about civilization, and it's about war. It's about forces of war, and about um, how to address both of them. But the source of that line, and I will 
build that dome in air, has been observed by the romantic scholar, the scholar of romantic poetry, Jack Stillinger, as a very direct echo of Michelangelo's boast, I will build that dome in air of um, St. Paul's uh, in, in Rome. And um, whether he actually said it or not is contested, but in the 18th century and 19th century, it was repeated all the time that he had boasted, I will um, build that dome in air. So, and my point is just that long before Kublai Khan, uh, that is the actual Kublai Khan, and uh, long, long into centuries when we are no longer living, um, there is the aspiration to, of course, to build an air which um, can be demonstrated most simply with a very familiar object, the Eiffel Tower. Now, when you look at this photograph, you might suspect that I went through every photograph of Eiffel Towers and just chose the one that looked airy, since I'm trying to um, talk about building an air. And your suspicion would be right. That is what I did. And I, had to, <laughs> and I had to pay Getty a lot of money for the permission to show even a bad quality of this uh, good photograph. But um, I, I, I also think that what it shows is um, actually the case, that it is, of course, very, very um, airy. And um, I, I will show this by posing a riddle. Then I'll give an answer, which no doubt many of you already know, but don't say it aloud so everybody else can work it out for himself or herself. And then I'll importantly tell you the source of the riddle so you'll um, attribute the cleverness of the riddle to my teacher and not to me. So here's the thousand foot high Eiffel Tower um, and it has many metal parts. The official Eiffel Tower website says it has 18,000 metallic pieces that together weigh 7,000 tons, actually 7,300 tons um, of metal and it required over two million um, rivets um, and w this is a picture taken, of course, standing underneath it, looking up so you can appreciate the metal. Now, here's the riddle, the question. If you were to collapse down the Eiffel Tower into the Eiffel Tower's footprint at the base, the 410 square feet of the footprint at the base, um, and melted it down, how high, how high would the pile or pool of metal be? And so you take a calculated um, for yourself, and then I'll tell you that the answer is it would be under three inches high, um, which is a way of just appreciating the fact that actually, of course, the Eiffel Tower is very airy. Now that is something that um, I learned from a, a course taught by uh, an engineering professor, Stephen Ressler, at um, West Point. Um, it's called Understanding the World's Great Structures, and I've taken this course three times. And some of the lectures I've seen five times, and actually my favorite moment is when he asks you um, how, how big the pile is going to be. And uh, Stephen Ressler um, shows that, that what this is all possible because the basic building material is the truss, and the Eiffel Tower is completely composed of trusses within trusses, which are incredibly strong. The triangle is an incredibly strong structural unit, as, as uh, most of you know, but a lay person like me did not know. And at the same time, um, very, very um, airy. And Ressler gives a lecture on the truss where he traces it from its first appearance in about the first century Rome. Uh, it was not in Greece, it was not in Egypt. And he sees it on a, a column, the Trajan column. There's a bridge that is made out of trusses. And goes all the way up through cathedral ceilings and up to I.M. Pei's um, pyramid outside the Louvre Museum. But this particular image that I found in the Encyclopedia Britannica shows that the truss is, in um, certain building forms, um, still very important. And um, I think even more impressive is the fact that the many century long aspiration to lift structures into the air can be best appreciated by noticing that the impossibly airy, impossibly strong triangle truss is present not only this in structures left standing in the air, but also in the tool that lifts those structures into the air, um, namely the crane. And if you look at the uh, array of 
cranes, uh, all of them are, of course, built of um, trusses of triangles. And um, this happens to be in Hong Kong, but um, it's true whether you're in uh, Beijing or um, in Shanghai um, or in London or in New York City or, or wherever, that the truss is able to um, carry its own weight and it, the weight of, uh, of, of men and also much more than the weight of men. So it's amazing that so minimal a structure, and like the Salgado tents, um, the, the, it's a, a kind of min minimal and delicate structure, um, and yet it can do all that um, heavy, heavy listing. Um, now, I titled this um, building in breath um, in part also because of the wind. And um, I think that probably all architectural students know, but again, as a layperson, I didn't know um, until I took this structural engineering course how much the load of the wind is the key problem in any kind of building, whether it's a horizontal structure like a bridge or a vertical structure like a building. Um, and uh, one thinks of the what's called the dead load or the weight of the materials themselves or the live load of people walking across it or trains or buses. But apparently, uh, the wind seems to play a big part, as uh, you probably know in the famous story of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge um, that in 1940 collapsed in a relatively mild wind, I think it was 40 miles an hour, it began to vibrate and then collapsed. Or um, you probably also know the, um, the story of the Citigroup skyscraper in New York where um, the architect had calculated the winds on the north, east, south, and west surface but not on the quadrant, northeast, northwest, et cetera, coming in on the corners, and only when a student called him and said, Ex exactly how are you calculating those winds? Did, he, did they, they realize they had a near disaster on their hands and had to completely um, revise the um, building? So as a result of having a slight exposure to, um, to these, these kinds of questions, I now see practically every building as really a sale. And I could go back through um, most of the buildings we've already encountered in this lecture and, um, and, and see it in terms of the wind. For example, the Eiffel Tower, as described by Eiffel himself, is um, very much a structure designed to accommodate the wind. The curvature of the uprights is mathematically determined to offer the most efficient wind resistant possible. All the cutting force of the wind passes into the interior of the leading edge uprights, lines drawn tan tangential to each upright with the point of each tangent at the same height will always intersect at a second point, which is exactly the point through which passes the flow resultant from the action of the wind on that part of the tower of support situated above the two points in question. Before coming together at the high pinnacle, the uprights appear to burst out of the ground and in a way to be shaped by the action of the wind. So too, the, earlier I, I mentioned a building by, uh, or several buildings by Moshe Safdi. Um, this is one of his buildings in, um, in the city of Chong, Chongqing um, that actually is, covers 10, more than 8 million square feet of building and um, it's conceived of as sails upon the water. It's at a place where two um, rivers meet. And um, again, it's an attempt to accommodate the fact that the pressure of people having to live in incredibly dense population centers and, um, and, and still having light and gardens and so forth. And um, if I go back to my first example of Odysseus, I talked about the beauty of Nausicaa, but actually Nausicaa is a midpoint in two building projects. Um, it, when Odysseus goes out into the sea, as I said before, he's endlessly tossed around. The east wind tosses him to the west, the west tosses him to the east, the north to the south, the south to the west, and he realizes that he can only survive 
by having an incredibly well-built raft. And I won't read this whole passage, but it's a gorgeous passage about Calypso giving him these beautiful, shimmering tools. The handle of the ax is, um, is made of olive wood. And all the, the, she takes him to a grove where the most beautiful, uh, long-standing trees are growing. And uh, he, he makes a raft, and we see it in full description. When he's on the ocean, a, um, a goddess, a, a, a malicious goddess who's in league with Neptune to destroy him, tries to convince him just to swim to shore. And he refuses. He won't abandon his raft. Um, but when the, the raft is uh, finally destroyed, he rides a plank into shore. And even then, he has a, a, a kind of a mimesis of a sail, because he's wearing a piece of cloth across his, his chest. Um, so it is uh, a, the building of the raft. The raft is, uh, for a time, the thing that intervenes between him and absolute destruction. And when he gets to Nausicaa, her advice is that she, he should please her mother in particular, because only if he does so will he get the assistance he needs to get where? To his well-built home. That is, it's to return to uh, another kind of building. And I hadn't noticed, but um, uh, a, a scholar has recently pointed out, a scholar named Carol Doherty, in, um, in a book called The Raft of Odysseus, that the only other object Odysseus makes is in book 23 of the Odyssey, when he builds a, um, a bed, an immovable bed, to, to register the fact that he's um, home. Um, the other attribute of air that I want to talk about is breath and voice. And um, buildings, I think, have a um, emphatic relation to, to voicing, as can be seen, for example, in Stonehenge. I'm teaching a course right now on Thomas Hardy, and in one of his books, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, um, Tess talks about the fact that Stonehenge is humming, and the person she's with, Angel Care, listens. The wind playing upon the edifice produced a booming tune like the note of some gigantic one-stringed instrument. Musical archaeologists are now actually exploring Stonehenge to see if it was conceived of as a musical instrument. Another quick example is the Whispering Arch at Clon McNoise, um, in which was a 12th century addition to a 5th century abbey in the west coast of Ireland. Um, where a priest or a penitent could speak very, very softly into the crevice of this arch, and it could be heard with perfect clarity on um, the other edge of the, of the arch. And the same is true of one of the buildings at Harvard, Seaver Hall, which I'm licensed to invoke because I read on Wikipedia that Venturi, Venturi said it was his favorite building in America, so it won't seem too parochial if I mention it. Um, but but uh, it's this arch that actually does uh, carry a very, very soft whisper all the way to the other side. And it might seem that these are just fanciful registrations of the idea of voice. But if you remember that a building, one of the things a building is trying to accommodate is, is accommodating our, our wish to be in a world with many other people and yet to have some kind of control over how much um, we're seeing of those other people. So the fact that, that the comic noise can um, accommodate the whispering voice of a priest or of lovers, um, and same with Seaver Hall, um, is, is just a registration of the fact that the capacity for in intimacy is, um, is made possible by, um, in part by, by um, buildings. Um, and I think that you know, there are characteristic sounds of cities. We, we often say that um, there's a low hum going on in cities. And the crystallographer William Bragg points out in his lectures on sound that the reason for that is that um, only low frequencies can have sound waves that can sweep around corners. The high frequency waves aren't making it around corners. And therefore, there is this, um, this, this continuous low um, hum. And you know, I was trying to think if I could actually claim that um, a truss 
uh, has a voice. And then I noticed on the way down here that every cell phone tower I passed was, of course, constructed of trusses. Um, so I think what the point that I really want to lead to is that um, beautiful things call on us to, to honor the life pact and also call on us to repair those pieces of architecture that violate the life um, pact. And I would like to point out in um, the moments that remain that um, our nuclear arsenal, um, I mean the United States nuclear arsenal, is a vast architecture that has no other aim than genocide. Probably you know the most recent research on nuclear winter, which shows that if not 1%, but 1 100th of 1% of the current arsenal is used, 44 million people will die on one day, and 1 billion people will die in the first month. It's also the case that, of course, it's not just human beings, but all birds, all mammals, um, many plants will be immediately devastated as well. Um, it happens that 90% of the weapons are owned by Russia and the United States. Everything from the blackout on this side is owned by the United States. Everything from the blackout on that side is owned by Russia. And these other countries, that whenever nuclear weapons are heard about, we hear about Iraq. Iraq has no nuclear weapons. We hear about Iran. Iran has no nuclear weapons. We hear about North, Car uh, North uh, Korea. Uh, North Korea has between 1 and 10. And by the way, the, uh, the, the graph tells you that the, they couldn't fit all the icons on, so you have to take each icon and multiply it by, um, by 5. People sometimes think that, um, that this arsenal is a holdover of the Cold War. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, for example, we have 14 Ohio-class submarines. Each submarine is the, um, equivalent, has the equivalent of 4,000 Hiroshima blasts. Um, eight, of those, um, eight of those submarines were made since the opening of the Berlin Wall. Um, now, 4,000 Hiroshima blasts is enough to destroy a continent. That means each Ohio-class submarine can destroy a continent. The Earth has seven continents. The United States has 14 Ohio-class submarines. And the um, Bush and Obama administrations have arranged for a trillion dollars to upgrade um, our nuclear weapons. And most other countries are therefore um, going to do the same thing. Now, this architecture is colossal. If we were right now in a submarine, um, probably, probably we could only fit the base of one missile um, in this room, maybe two, and they would go up three stories. Um, and there are 24 of them on each ship. So you're really in, um, as one writer describes it, a kind of forest of the submarine. So it's, it's a huge architecture. The same is true of our ICBMs um, in the Midwest, the 450 of them that are left. But though these are colossal, they are nearly invisible because they're under the sea or they're underground. Um, and because we, as citizens, um, we and our legislature have com been completely evicted from any say over this, um, and therefore are barely aware that it goes on. So in the, in the book that Mark mentioned, which is called Thermonuclear Monarchy, that tries to show the um, complete dismantling of governance that comes about with this architecture where one man or one woman, the president of the United States, has first use powers to uh, carry out genocidal uh, acts. People are worried that, this, that Trump will do this, and, and as well, we should be worried. But it's a worry no matter who is president, because though Trump may, according to some people, of whom I'm one, be crazy nearly 100% of the time, um, <laughs> Most people are crazy a little bit of the time uh, and have only a few seconds in which to make decisions. At any rate, this book opens by proposing a metaphor for visualizing this. And here's the important thing about this metaphor. It is not an exaggeration. If anything, it is an understatement. But it's simply a way to reimagine it. So I'll just give you the first two paragraphs and the, the metaphor goes on for, I don't know, five or seven or 10 pages. Imagine that there one day came to Earth something, sometime in the future, a solitary country with a new technology. 
The, te the technology has let this solitary country station a door, or more precisely, a series of doors, under the floor of every other country of the world. If the leader of the solitary country ever feels imperiled or impeded by another country, he can open the trap door and in a single day eliminate the population of that rival country. Because the arrangement of doors beneath each national floor is sectioned, the leader can alternatively choose to eliminate just part of the enemy country, a fourth of it or a third of it. He might choose to open the doors beneath the floor of the opponent's military installations only, thereby eliminating those installations and, say, one thirtieth of the country's population. As a shorthand, this ingenious technology and the policies that enable its use might be called the flexible floor doctrine. Um, now, a number of architects have made drawings of this flexible floor, um, and I'll just show you them. This one is made by Carolyn um, Dayer, and um, you can see the word clear, but the word nuclear starts in the upper left-hand corner. This one was made by Magdalena Agu, and um, Magdalena put, took words from the text and inscribe them uh, around the various parts of the architectural units of this floor. And the particular passage she focused on was this one. Though it is hard to conceive of an international arrangement with greater asymmetry and therefore greater unfairness, the advanced, company might, the advanced country might come to think of itself as fair, even as the fairest of nations, for it each day has the power to annihilate millions of people, and each day, or almost each day, abstains from doing so. Other countries, in its view, seem to hit each other with sticks and stones every chance they get. The inhabitants of Earth will find it in their interest to agree with the lever country's description of its own generosity. And here comes the sentence that, she, that Magdalena puts in her picture. They cannot influence whether the flexible floor is absent or present, but only whether it stays closed or suddenly drops open beneath them, and they can diminish the chance of its dropping open beneath them by smiling, waving, and in general being cooperative and quiet. And um, I don't know if you can see the, the words um, here, but she, she has other renderings, and she has many compartments in the floor as a reminder that um, ordinary life is going on um, in this world. Um, this, this architect is someone who, for some reason, always puts cats in her drawing. And, <laughs> and here there's this maniacal cat who has installed this floor beneath every other country. And I'm just going to show you two of the uh, drawings, but she, she actually made a number of them. Here's another one where um, the, the thermonuclear monarch is, uh, is, is at work. Um, Anyway, I hope but the, the, the key aspiration of this lecture is that, that beauty will work on, on everyone to um, help dismantle this architecture, because it's only if it's widely worked on that it, it will be um, dismantled. And um, beauty has already been uh, seen as a call to work towards the elimination of global warming. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. There's one other uh, rendering of the floor of the world um, by Christine Prochnow. Um, this is Andy, Goldsworthy, uh, Andy Goldsworthy's, uh, one of his pictures from his new book, Ephemeral Works. And um, I think that many architects uh, use the beauty of the world to call on us to help repair injuries. This is. Um, his taking of sycamore leaves beneath a sycamore and um, putting them in a way that foregrounds the root system. And in fact, in the case of global warming, which is obviously also something we need to work on, although I would quickly say it's not clear how to reverse global warming. It's very clear how to, to get rid of nuclear weapons. It's, it's, they're very, compared to global warming, they're very easy to dismantle. And um, the, the actual danger to Earth is much closer and uh, will happen in a much shorter span of time once it starts to happen. But the, the fact that beauty uh, is used as, as a call is, um, I think, audible in Maya Lin's uh, 
what's missing exhibit where you hear lots of species that are in danger of dying out. But it's also present in all kinds of, um, of journals, National Geographic, Scientific American, Wired Magazine, the NASA website, that talks about climate change while also reminding us that the, um, that the Earth is, is beautiful. Um, I talked about breath. I learned the other day that the, the Earth itself um, is rising and falling eight inches a, a day each day um, because of the gravitational pull. Just as the oceans have a big gravitational pull on them, there is a, um, a geophysicist at MIT who writes about the fact that um, there's a kind of lift and fall of the ground on, on which we stand. So um, I hope that um, all of us can, can at some point work to rid ourselves of this um, very life-denying um, architecture. Thank you very much. Do you have to have a question? Of course. Or voice a complaint. Thank you very much. Uh, there's something so beautiful about nuclear submarines that has to do with the uh, destructiveness of them. And, and if we're honest, there's probably even something beautiful about those photographs of Hiroshima, etc. What does one? What do you do with that? Um, uh, well, and <laughs> I don't think there's anything beautiful about the photographs of Hiroshima. The, the photographs of Hiroshima that we've mostly seen are incredibly edited. They were at the beginning. People were not allowed to, um, to publicize photographs of what injuries look like. Um, I tried to do an exhibit and did do an exhibit last um, February at the Central Square Library, one of the libraries in uh, Cambridge, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, understandably, I mean, it was wonderful that Central Square Library let us do an exhibit. Um, but the librarians took down the pictures of the injuries, which I understand, because people ha aren't prepared. Even though if you go to Hiroshima Museum, you just see scores of school children coming in and taking in what those photographs look like. Um, the, you know, a, a study was done of um, what a nuclear explosion would be like in Rotterdam if only a tiny Hiroshima size, 13 uh, kilograms, was used. And um, that is the, the, the proposed that a terrorist might get hold of some material and bring it in. What the states have is vast by compared with that. And it's on alert, it's ready to go, and the targets are assigned. The targets are assigned. But even this small one, um, you know, the, the effects come from radioactivity, the effects come from burns, the effects come from blast power. Um, the, um, the number of people who would be burned is 20,000, 10,000 of whom would live but need critical care. 10,000, there are only 100 burn beds in Netherlands. When I first read that statistic, I thought, well, I thought what, Netherlands was a really civilized country. It only has 100 burn beds. Then I looked at the Mass General website, which is a leading hospital in the United States. It has seven burn beds. Th so nuclear weapons eliminate the right of self-defense, and they eliminate the uh, capacity for mutual aid. There is no way to help with that. Um, so I, don't, I, I have seen a lot of photographs of Hiroshima. And I can't remember one. If you're talking about the mushroom cloud, the hypocrisy, the survivors of Hiroshima say, we saw no mushroom cloud. That's what people who are far away saw. That's what the 
the photographer on the Enola Gay saw. It's not what people on the ground see. Um, so, and nothing on the ground that I've seen looks beautiful. Now, the nuclear submarine is a beautiful um, uh, object. And the, um, and, and the, let me just say that in the book I say, you know, we're, we've got two huge, magnificent, in terms of the work they take, inventions posed against each other. Social contract and constitutions on the one hand, and nuclear weapons on the other hand. And each is spreading, and each can only spread if it can defeat the other. Because if you have constitutions, you can't have nuclear weapons and vice versa. But um, the nuclear submarine as a, as a ship, as a capacity to go underground, can be used for many other things. It can be used to map the floor of the ocean. It could be used to uh, you know, maybe find more efficient ways to get uh, medical supplies from a country that has them to a country that doesn't have them. I don't think there's anything beautiful um, at all about the missiles themselves or the injuries they do. In fact, and not everyone will agree with this, people fault me for not using the word ugly in the book. I don't understand the use of the word ugly in relation to beautiful. For me, the opposite of beauty is injury. And there's no way that uh, nuclear weapons uh, can, can be eligible, in, in my view, for, uh, for, for that. You know, I think that, well, maybe we'll go on to other things. Yeah, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, this kind of subject matter just makes your head, like, explode, Wait a second. right? Where, where are you? Where are you? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, it, I mean, it, I don't understand, though, how, I mean, I thought you used that use of the term structure perception was really interesting, and that that was, and I'd like to hear more about that, but how do you avoid, I mean, you just, for the first time in stating that you didn't, wouldn't use the word ugly, but you say beautiful and injury, or the opposite would be injury, that just that alone, trying to figure that out in terms of the object or the kind of status of beauty or the pr protection of life seems to me very difficult to, to do. I mean, so I'm curious about wh whether you've been tempted to give a kind of taxonomy to the beauty that it's been, you know, from the usual sublime to the pretty or whatever, um, or to engage with parsing beauty. Some beauty produces actually is beautiful because it's completely indifferent to life in a sense, and that's sort of technological sublime as Hiroshima or whatever. So I'm just curious about whether you've been tempted to contend with, you know, those his, his long philosophical history of trying to figure yeah. it out. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm actually not tempted to do a taxonomy other than maintaining the opposition between beauty and injury. And there's a problem with that, which I'll come back to if there's time. But um, the, in fact, the, the, even the division into the beautiful and sublime is, to me, a, a, a mistake. And I don't think Burke and Kant meant it to be um, deleterious to beauty. But if you look at um, Kant's observations on the beautiful and sublime, which he wrote before the, the third uh, critique, um, it's clear that, that uh, you know, he, that, that the, you know, Sublime is masculine, uh, the beautiful is feminine. The sublime is mighty and close to the metaphysical, and the beautiful is um, diminutive. It's like flowers in the field. So he took this whole field that had been unified. And I, and I think the work of Burke and Kant was really intended to extend the realm of, uh, of aesthetic objects, to include things that were mighty and uh, fear-inspiring. But the result was that it divided what had been a unified field and made it so that the beautiful somehow was blocked from access to the, uh, to the metaphysical. And in fact, during the time when beauty was um, evicted, and I was writing about it because it was evicted from the humanities, but then I would hear from all kinds of people in other realms, art studios, architecture, um, buildings, museums, many museum directors said that, that I mean, their museums are full of, of beautiful things, and yet they weren't supposed to talk about beauty. But um, during the time it was evicted, the word that came in was sublime. And to me, the confusion about that 
is in nothing so apparent as in the term, which isn't you know, your invention, you're just citing it, nuclear sublime. Um, it's, it's like speaking from a complete um, position of invulnerability uh, to, you know, uh, and, and um, now anything positive can be enlisted into an evil act. You know, we often think, well, if beauty can be enlisted into an evil act, it must be a flaw in beauty. But we know from history that th there's actually nothing you can think of. Motherhood has been enlisted into evil acts uh, by some regimes. The solstice has been enlisted into evil acts by some regimes. So the fact that it can be enlisted, yeah, it, it can be. Um, but that isn't, th that is a kind of dismantling from the interior of the thing itself. Now the problem with, with even the taxonomy that I'm giving of beauty versus injury is that um, you don't want to think that if you're injured, you're outside the realm of beauty. But the, the, the point of it is that we always have to be clear on, on being opposed to injury. I think several, you know, I think you might disagree. Um, but it, to my mind, you don't want uh, the, the species to get confused about whether injury or non-injury is better. Um, and the, the, you know, let's say, for example, that um, I lose the use of my legs. And so you could say, well, it's, the, the, the opposition I'm proposing isn't good because now it seems like I'm, you know, outside any sphere. But the thing is that our first impulse has to be when someone loses the use of their legs to try and repair their legs. And if you can't repair their legs, then you revise the city so that it's no longer a disadvantage to not be able to use your legs. You have ramps, you have bus lifts, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't start by saying, well, let, we could either have you know, people with injury or without injury. I think that's really a mistake. Um, and I, but I understand that it's something about which people can sometimes disagree. I think we have time for one more question. Hello. Hello. Um, so in your, thank you for the lecture, by the way. In your lecture, you talked about beauty, but it was, seemed very nature-centric or potentially uh, earth-centric. Especially this last slide, we can see it's very earth-centric. And in the spirit of thermonuclear warfare, um, especially in world-ending scenarios, uh, many... The conversation is now heading towards maybe a world is the earth is not a or human civilization is not a single planet um, life form and in my in that question i would ask you how do you think the our conceptions of beauty our conception or our, our conceptions of beauty would change in a scenario where earth's nature is not the nature through which we find beauty well you know one thing that's really interesting is that to me, the people who are most aware of the problem of nuclear weapons are astronomers, and like Martin Rees, who's the royal astronomer of, um, of uh, England. And there are a number of others. And uh, you know, at first, that struck me as peculiar, because they're every day looking out at these incredible galaxies and, and wonderful spiral, this and that, and so forth. And yet, they are so worried about uh, nuclear weapons in a way that um, you know, many people just shrug off. And um, far from their access to other galaxies um, diminishing their uh, sense of the preciousness of Earth, it, it magnifies it. You know, it certainly seems the case that there's life, uh, has to be life else, elsewhere. Um, in, the, in the universe, but um, it, it so far appears that it's not uh, that common a, uh, a, an event. Um, and you're, you're right that I'm really emphasizing nature here. And there's, there's um, you know, 
I, I, I wanted to try and speak directly to the question of building because you know we're an architecture conference. But my more usual way of addressing the relation of beauty and what it demands of us in terms of nuclear weapons is to talk about beauty and justice, which doesn't involve talking uh, as much about nature. It involves talking about um, things like symmetry, and not just bilateral symmetry, but duodecahedrons inside octahedrons and so forth. Because every theory of justice, every theory of justice entails a symmetry, um, uh, whether it's, it's talking about how you have to find punishment symmetrical to the crime, or whether it's um, Rawls talking about um, fairness as requiring a symmetry of all our relations with one another. Um, and I also talk about it in terms of the um, notion given by philosophers Som Simone Weil and Iris Murdoch um, that beauty carries out a kind of act of unselfing. It, it, it makes people selfless. It makes them willing to be marginal because you're, as, as Iris Merck says, you're all consumed with yourself and your worries and your um, insults that you've received and suddenly you see something beautiful and you, you just are happy to be on the sidelines. And I think that's very unusual because the, the, there are lots of things in the world that produce acute pleasure um, and there are lots of things in the world that make you feel marginal and beside the point. There are very few things, in fact, it's only beauty that does it, that can both make you seem very marginal and give you acute pleasure. Um, and it's a very uh, special uh, feature. And, and then the, the third feature that I often emphasize is the one that Mark talked about of creation and iteration and doing it uh, this, it causing a, a kind of spread. The beautiful thing will be repeated and then repeated by someone else and passed on and so forth. And, um, but it, it happens that, you know, as everyone always says, I mean, I've seen lots of pictures of other galaxies and they are incredible. Um, but the, um, it's hard to imagine a planet more beautiful than Earth. In fact, the, the one picture that I showed, I think, at the beginning of when I was talking about nuclear weapons, um, that's a particular photograph from NASA that is considered the most accurate in terms of the colors of Earth. It's called blue marble, and it's the one, they, they have lots of um, photographs on their, their site that um, sometimes have to use color filters and so forth to get the features clearly in view. Um, whereas this one is just an accurate representation. Um, so, um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to see nature as uh, full of many problems and full of, you know, rabies and uh, tigers and hurricanes and earthquakes, but also uh, many, many beautiful things. Leave just yet, but let's thank Elaine. Thank you. I want to thank Mark for inviting Elaine and thank Elaine for something I, I won't give into the temptation to call it beautiful, but it was a truly stunning lecture. Uh, truly stunning. Uh, now, I'm about to invite you all, everybody in this room and in the other two rooms, to our uh, reception. We, we are, like to be hospitable here at the School of Architecture, uh, and we have receptions after our lectures. Uh, recently, this year, I should say, under my tenure, uh, Robert Simonson, who is the noted cocktail scholar and historian and the distilled spirits writer for the New York Times, which I think is a title worth coveting, um, uh, curates these drinks uh, and tries to connect them in some way to our speakers. Um, tonight's drink is a version of the Harvard cocktail. It was created by Robert, actually, specifically for Elaine Scarry. Um, it's a clear like the sky version of the traditional Harvard cocktail. The traditional Harvard cocktail is actually a kind of a brandy Manhattan. Uh, this version contains Pisco, which is a clear Peruvian brandy uh, with a white vermouth and 
to quote the email that Robert sent me last week after reading a little bit of your work, as elegant and smooth a drink as the writer herself. So there you go. Um, upstairs.